Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Rappaport. And as director of the Center for the Study of Constitutional Originalism, it's really a pleasure to welcome everyone to San Diego and USD for the third annual Works in Progress Conference on Originalism. You know, when we were planning this conference, the first conference, two years ago, we really didn't know what to expect. While we thought that the amount of original scholarship would justify having a conference, an annual conference, we were really not sure whether the quantity and quality of that scholarship would meet our expectations. But happily, when the submissions came in, it was clear that the first conference was going to be first rate. When we organized, started to organize the second conference, we had similar questions. Had the first year exhausted all of the good papers? <laughs> you know, but happily, there was no sophomore jinx. I really think the second conference was the equal of the first. And so when we started to organize this year's conference, we felt confident that we would have a sufficient supply of good papers. What surprised us, however, was really the significant increase in the number of quality papers submitted. It was really hard to pick the papers, right? We, we really could have doubled or tripled the size of the conference and still, I think, been proud of our efforts. We've also been pleasantly surprised by the increase in the number of scholars who have been willing to come here to San Diego in the wintertime. Um, to participate in the conference, you know, even though they're not presenting or commenting on a paper. Well, all this suggests that there's enough interest and scholarship for the Works in Progress Conference to be an annual event for the foreseeable future. And happily, this has now been made possible by the Hugh and Hazel Darling Foundation, and we're, we're very grateful for their generosity for both the conference and for all the other things that they make possible at the Originalism Center. Um, the significant number of submissions to the conference, though, really raises a question about the growth of originalist scholarship. Over the summer, I had a research assistant uh, do some simple searches. They ran a, a, a simple search of law review articles that had originalism in the title, or original intent or some variant in the title. And the growth in, of those articles really has been dramatic. In 2003, there were nine articles. And then from that point on, 15, 28, 57, and now it's in the 60s and 70s every year all the way up to 2010. Right? So, of course, I, I suppose one could do more refined searches, but just as a simple search, I think it's a really significant indication of the growth of original scholarship. If one moves from the quantitative perspective to a qualitative one, I think the growth in original scholarship appears similar. Like a river that's been released from a dam, <laughs> original scholarship has been flowing into area after area. Um, and, and while in the past, original scholarship focused in on relatively few clauses, in recent years, really, it has expanded. It now covers so many areas that few people really can keep up with all of it. If you, restricting myself only to the new areas involving amendments, right, new areas involving amendments, there have been significant pieces on, of course, the, the Second Amendment, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, Eighth, thirteenth. Of course, some areas appear to have been on higher ground and have escaped the water so far, such as maybe the 15th Amendment, but that may not last so long. I also believe there's been a significant increase in the growth in scholarship on the 14th Amendment. For example, if you just look at the, the papers that have been submitted to the annual conference that we've had for the last three years at USD, the number of papers on the 14th Amendment 
is equal to the number on all the other clauses in the Constitution. The growth in original scholarship, I think, is related to at least two causes. First, there's been a widening of support for originalism. Initially, at least in modern times, most originalists were conservatives. Then originalism expanded, I think, next to libertarians, and then more recently to liberals. Um, even non-originalists are writing originalist articles. For example, I see that Barry Friedman has just written an originalist piece defending the dormant commerce clause. The second cause is, of course, the growth of originalism on the Supreme Court. With more justices who are originalists, it's more attractive to write originalist articles. But I think the causation also runs in the opposite direction. As there's more original scholarship, it's easier for the justices to decide cases in accordance with the original meaning, both because there's more support for originalism and because there's more knowledge about what the original meaning actually is. The most obvious example here, of course, is the Second Amendment, but it is by no means the only one. Finally, th this growth of originalism on the Supreme Court, I think, is worthy of some brief comments. Um, obviously, two members of the court, Scalia and Thomas, are pretty clearly strong originalists. And at the same time, I think it seems pretty clear that the five most liberal members of the court, including probably the two new appointees, are not originalists, although they're sometimes willing to join originalist opinions. The most interesting questions are obviously where Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito stand. A discussion of these justices' attitudes towards originalism would require a paper or two in itself, which might be a good idea for next year's conference. But for now, I think one can at least say that Roberts and Alito are probably more disposed to join originalist opinions than the five more liberal members of the court. Not a terribly strong claim. Um, overall, then, I think the, the, the willingness of the other justices to join originalist opinions makes it possible for the court to generate originalist opinions, even though only two members of the court are clear originalists. At the same time, however, this minority of originalists on the court means that it's unlikely that the court is going to consistently follow originalism overall or even in specific areas. Well, let me now turn from the growth of originalism to our conference. Putting together a conference of this sort involves a great deal of work, so I'd like to thank various people. First, I want to thank Mike Ramsey. Mike planned the conference with me from the very beginning, doing an enormous amount of work at every stage. I also want to thank Steve Smith, who also put in a significant amount of work on the conference. Thanks also go to Dean Stephen Ferullo, who's not here now, but will be here later on, for his support for both the conference and the center. In addition, I want to thank Trang Pham, the law school's event coordinator, for all of her hard work and doing just really a million things all in the last week, with a smile on her face. Um, and finally, I want to reiterate our thanks to Rick Stack and the Darling Foundation for their generous support. Right, let me now say a few words about administrative matters concerning the conference. The papers will work as follows. First, the paper presenter will have approximately 10 minutes to summarize their paper. The commentator will then have approximately 10 minutes to give their comments. And then we'll give the presenter two to three minutes to respond if they want to. We'll then open it up for a discussion with a cue kept by the moderator. To avoid the situation where the paper presenter feels the need to respond to every comment made by a participant, the discussion is going to follow 
as we did last year, a rule of three. The moderator will allow three persons to speak and then we'll give the presenter and the commentator an opportunity to respond if they wish. So, so three comments from the audience and then uh, an opportunity to respond. Presenters should not feel obligated to respond to every question. That's not, not what we're doing here. Well, with these announcements completed, I thought we might start the conference by having everyone introduce themselves and their affiliation. We'll go around the room. I'm Mike Rappaport, the University of San Diego. My name is Ilya Selman, George Mason University. John McGinnis, Northwestern. Mike Paulson, University of St. Thomas. Andrew Kent, Fort. Jamal Green, Columbia. Steve Smith, San Diego. Tom Colby, George Washington. Jennifer Mason, Edward, Notre Dame. Rob Smith, Thomas Jefferson. Mark Moeller, DePaul. Mike Ramsey, USD. John McKyle, Georgetown. Lyman Schwartzchild, San Diego. Chris Green, Ole Miss. Kurt Lash, Illinois. Don Drips, USD. Mark Hackstein, Harvard. Garrett Evans, <coughs> Baltimore. Jack Vulcan, Yale. Brian Willen, Thomas Jefferson. David Oakham, University of Dallas. 